together on seclosounds.org Your listening station Good morning and welcome to this week's Sticks Radio Show here on Seclo Sounds with me, Terry Sullivan and today it's the second part of the Flashback feature uh, we're going to be talking to two artists who are going to appear in that Flashback later on in the hour I'm going to tell you how you can win tickets to go to Flashback up in Rockingham on the 9th and 10th of July. But today on the show I've got, later on, Nick Hayward from Haircut 100. You may remember them from the 80s. Great band. My guest today is, well, I hope he's got his prescription with him. Uh, it's the doctor from Doc doing the medics. Good morning. Hello, good morning, everybody. hope everyone's doing well up there. Oh, we, we're doing great. I mean, you you come from Liverpool. What a place for show business. <laughs> You've done your research. Oh, I have. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, born in Liverpool, though. I didn't stay there a long, long time, but uh, left when I was six. My dad had to move to London for work, which is why you can't hear the Scouse accent. But uh, I think the best thing um, that we've done for many years, uh, which kind of brings us to the flashback show, actually. Mm-hmm. So if you let me go off on a tangent for a Course, little bit. Of course, you do. Um, the, the, Liverpool had the, was a city of culture in 2008, and they put out a list saying, here we are, Liverpool's had more number one artists than any other city. Here's a list of the artists. And I looked and I wasn't there. And they said they made it 56. So I emailed them, I'll make it 57. Birth certificate attached, spirit in the sky. And Janice Longbesser so said, oh, bloody hell, of course, we forgot about Clive. Um, so they did this thing called the Number One Project, where you recorded another Liverpool hit number one. We did Two Tribes um, by Frankie Goes yeah. to Hollywood uh, for a charity record. But then the greatest thing ever was they did a gig at the Liverpool Arena, the Echo Arena, which was only the second ever gig there. Ringo Starr had opened it the week before. And then you went on with all the other bands who had number ones in Liverpool and uh, from Liverpool. And they were very, I mean, a sort of scaffold were brilliant. You know, they had the farm there. It was wonderful. Wow. But the highlight of it for me was going on at the end and singing You'll Never Walk Alone with Jerry Marsden oh. in front of 13,000 Liverpudlians. Yep. And it was, I've got to say, it's one of those moments you remember uh, for life and one of the reasons you do this. But the, one, the agent who saw me there, he was the first guy who said, I want you to do what you did there for some of these 80s shows like Flashback now. So that gig, that connection with Liverpool actually has served me well. It might not have given me as much talent as many of the other people, wow. but it got me on that show, which has got me on this, on this circuit, and, it's, uh, and these are shows that I love doing. So maybe it was prophetic. Maybe the Liverpool connection was prophetic. Well, you say about the number ones, that there's only two bands have had the first three singles go to number one, and that was Jerry and yep. Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Yep. And, and I had the great pleasure of meeting and interviewing Jerry Marsden four or five years ago, and I asked him what he'd like to be remembered for, and he said his, his number one his number one hits and his OBE. Wonderful. What a great guy. But the, the talent in I mean I know you said you left there, but the talent I mean it's not just the the the, uh, the, the records; it's also the the comedy and the sort of like I mean it, it's amazing the amount of talent that comes out of uh, Liverpool. Well, I, I think I think you know I think. There is, there is an attitude, you know, there is mm. an attitude, and when I go back there, when I play there, I do just love going in the pubs, and of course I walk in, I'm six foot three, I've got long hair, um, it's not long because someone's latched onto me one way or another, and we're having a bit of a banter, you know, and, it, and I love all that, and I think it just comes naturally, I think it just gets passed down, and, and you know, within ten minutes you're usually laughing, you know, yeah. <laughs> or you're running for your life, but... <laughs> No, it, 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 it's fantastic, you know, right, yeah, I, I just love that sort of down-to-earth, no frill. I think it's just kind of a down-to-earth, no-frills approach to yeah. life, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm a Liverpool fan, and being a Liverpool fan over the last few decades hasn't been easy. So no, I think we've well, got to have a sense of humour about it. If I'm else. a Spurs fan, so we need to have a sense of humour. I mean, this, I, I mean, I know a few Liverpudlians myself, and they're very direct. And if you sort of... You know, if somebody comes up to them and say, does my bum look big in this? They say, no, it looks big in everything. And that's the sort of <laughs> cutthroat thing. Anyway, well, I've got to ask you, are you really a doctor? Uh, OK, the truth behind that one was, uh, when I left school, I did go for some interviews. I was going to go to medical college. And I did make one interview, actually, at Guy's College. And I, and I, did t- I turned up, and I had pink, cropped, short uh, hair at the time. And I think the interview lasted about three minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I kind of walked out there thinking that'll be a no then. So 
So when I started DJing, I was a DJ before I started singing, mm-hmm. I just chose the name of the doctor as my revenge on the medical profession. So, <laughs> so can, why did you choose the doctor? Just just because you wanted your revenge on the medical profession? Well, partly that as well, but partly I was DJing and, uh, mm. you know, and uh, sort of, you look back to people like uh, Captain Beefheart, Dr. Mm. John, people who had one of these, you know, sort of, things before their name, and I thought, well, I could have Captain, and then I thought, oh, well, no, Captain's got Captain, so I'll do Doctor then. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and now I'm very good friends with Captain, so yes, the Captain and the Doctor do go out for the odd pint every now and then. Is it the Doctor on your passport? No, it doesn't. It no, so, not, I mean, no, no, <laughs> not even this country is stupid enough <laughs> to let anyone get away with putting <laughs> that on their, on their passport. Be... However... It is on my equity card. Is it? Oh, well, that's I good. I am the only person. When, they, when, when I registered for equity, I thought, oh, what's your first chosen professional name? I thought, oh, someone's bound to have, have this, aren't they? So I put the doctor down. It comes back. So on my equity card, it says the doctor. So I'm thinking of suing the BBC for Doctor Who now. Ah, and look, <laughs> mate, you've had my name for the last 60 years. I want your royalties. Yeah, so I mean, that, you, you, were, you mentioned you were DJ in London. At the, it was probably the great times. I, I mean, I was a DJ in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, and the music was sensational, and the club circuit was sensational then, wasn't it? Well, it was, and it was fresh, and it was exciting, because mm. when I say I ran a nightclub, that I'm, not, I'm not a Peter String fellow, in case everyone's there, there thinking what a flash so-and-so nightclubs, you know. Uh, what it was was you used to take over mm. a nightclub for a night a week, and ours was the, it was not the most um, attractive night of the week. It was a Monday night. Um, mm. and now, if you're going to pick a night for a nightclub, the one that's going to fail the work most is Monday, because everyone's been out Friday, Saturday, possibly Sunday or recovered Sunday. They're not looking to go out to a nightclub on a Monday night. But for some, but for some reason, we got night, nightclub of the year in 1987, and we ran the club for 15 years, and it went on a Monday. It was, it was. It kind of developed its own character, but we started off as a kind of a psychedelic revival club because at that time, I thought, it was 1982, I thought, we're getting a bit too po-faced here. I think the new romantic thing was getting a bit too serious. It was all about the look and less about... uh, And I think it was starting to go down a bit of a run. You had a lot of great talent came out of it. Mm. It was starting to go down a bit of a po-faced route. So we started... So we went on the antithesis of that, started a psychedelic club, and we were playing glam rock and Nirvana and... Uh, we were having like custard pie fights and jelly ceremonies down in the club, and it it just sort of caught people's attention, and it ran for a long time, and very very fond memories. And we had bands like the Damned and the Cult play down there. Uh-huh. Bands were like like Zodiac Mind Warp did their first gig. The Mission did their first gig down there. It really was uh, being involved in it was very exciting. You know, it was fantastic. So I absolutely loved it, but. Uh, London being the place it is, it keeps moving on and moving on. So we, yeah, we, when time we, came to close it, yeah, we closed it and put the memories uh, put the memories in the locker and went on to something else. Yeah, because it was around the 79, 80 and the 81 period when I was, I was DJing as well. In, I was doing, like... Uh, clubs and pubs and all over the place. It, there was so much good music. There was there was the punk stuff and then there was the new wave stuff. And it was still Bowie and, and Mark Bolan was still very popular as well then. And it was it was it was great because it, it, you, you never knew what you were going to have to play when you went to these clubs. No, exactly, exactly. People, you know, when you look at punk being the kind of the start of everything, yeah. because. Um, you, I mean, even you mentioned Bolan and Bowie. I think they embraced punk. I mm. mean, Mark Bolan uh, took the damned on tour with him, and Bowie obviously morphed, you know, alongside punk. But I think the glam period before that was very rock and pop, mm. and I think it was getting a bit stayed. It started, it was great fun, you know. That's one of the things that inspired me, was seeing Wizard on top of the pops with roller skating angels throwing custard pies. <sighs> And I thought, forget Led Zeppelin, this is what I want. Uh, and that was, that was a great fun period. I think punk kind of took a lot of that. Um, and I, I, then I think from punk, it kind of splintered into so many, the rock side of punk, you mm. know. Um, and then you had the kind of the more creative new wave side. And then the pop music that it produced, if you think about it, from bands like Blondie and Ultravox, you know, a lot of those bands started as punk bands. You know, Simply Red, Mark, you know, he yeah. was singing, oh, what's that? I can't remember their name. I uh, can't remember the name of the punk band he was in. But a lot of those artists yeah. wouldn't have even got on a stage if it wasn't for punk. So we've got a lot to be grateful for, for punk rock. And as you say, at that time, 
uh, everything was happening. I mean, you know, the, the Human League, you know, when, when you, you know, the electronic music, that yeah. was exploding as well. Mm. So you had all these different things. It, amazing times, really. It was, and you had the guitar bands. I mean, yeah, mid was in a band called The Rich Kids, I remember that. So, uh, That's it, with Glenn Matlock. Yeah. Uh, who went on to become the Sex Pistols? And I can, oh, I can't remember the next. Oh, I can't <laughs> no. remember them all. They had so many. A lot of these bands morphed into different other ones, and it's it's just amazing. Well, we're um, sounding like a couple of old geezers. Well, we are, aren't we? <laughs> we are, I think we are a couple of old. Well, well I, I was going to say that other word, but never mind. I won't be saying that one. Uh, yeah, we are sounding like a couple of old men, don't we? Really, but I mean, you, you, you. May, how did you make the jump from being a DJ to being a performer? Because of they're very different. I mean, I, I can DJ, but there's no, I can't perform by any means. Well, some people would say I can't. But, oh well, um, I'm, I'm saying nothing. Who haven't seen me yet? I can. Um, <laughs> but, um, no, it's uh, it, it, well. What it was, it was a, I was bet by someone um, that I couldn't form a band. I was DJing. He was playing down my club, and he said, "Oh yeah, you know, that's right, DJing." But you know, you can never be in a band. And I said, "Of course I can." Said, Any old fool can do that. Uh, so he bet me, and two weeks later he had a gig, and he bet me that I couldn't get a band together to support him, and we did. In two weeks, we wrote two songs. We put a shambolic set of songs together, including White Horses from the kids' television program. I remember it well. That run, White Horse. I remember it. Right. These boots are made for walking. Uh, you know, all sorts of nonsense in there. And we went on stage, and we blew them off. And I thought, oh, I quite like this. <laughs> and so we carried on, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to keep doing this while I'm enjoying it. I'm just going to have a real laugh with this. And you know what? I'm still enjoying it, and I'm still having a real laugh with it. So, you know, the day, the day I stop, I won't do it, because the day you're not enjoying it and you're up there on the stage, the first people who notice are the crowd, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's OK being Leonard Cohen and going on and being a bit grumpy that day, but Doctor and the Medics, if you're not enjoying it, I, I think the crowd won't buy into it anymore. So, uh, I, yeah, still loving it all these years later. That's 35 years now. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it's actually now... The 30th anniversary of Spirit and Sky getting to number one in 30 it's... years uh, this year, this June. Yeah, why, why did you particularly choose? I mean, there's, there's hundreds of records you could cover, thousands of records, millions of records you could cover. Why did you particularly choose that one? Well, I think Spirit and the Sky was just, uh, it was just there to be discovered, but to be played by Dr. And the Medics. I, I kind of email Norman Greenbaum now every year or so. Um, he's the guy who wrote it, if people mm. who don't know, and had the original hit with it. And we're now kind of at Facebook pen pals. And um, he, 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 he loves our version of it. And he, he, said you kind of, he, he said you kind of took it. He said, the song found you. OK, and I think that's true because we'd started m- messing around with it in the studio. I think we played, jammed a version of it live once. And then I had this bizarre dream where I met John Lennon and Yoko Ono and we were in a pub. And Mark Bolan was sat cross-legged in the corner playing Spirit in the Sky acoustically. And uh, I went in the next day into the studio and told everybody about this. And all had a bit of a laugh. And there we are. We, start, we started to play it. And the record company said, that's, you know, that's going to be the single. And we said, <laughs> OK, we'll go, we'll go along with that. So that's why, as our tribute to that dream, if you listen very carefully, in the 80s, mm. you used to double, treble, quadruple track your voice to get that sort of mm. 80s sound. So on a couple of the tracks, instead of singing When They Lay Me Down to Rest, I'm singing When They Lay Me Down to Rex. And it's <laughs> a little tribute to me dreams. I think Mark, I think that's, I think Mark Boland helped waft that song in my direction. There you go. It, it does sound... It, it, if Mark Boland had recorded it, you wouldn't have been surprised, would you? No, and it that's has. another reason why we kind of... When we sat down and we thought, well, what, what, what are we going to do with it? We can't just recreate the original. Because I love the original, mm. but the original has got that almost bluesy... It kind of oozes, you know, it, does, it, it throbs slightly. Whereas, um, I've got to be careful what I say here, whereas our version kind of rocks a bit more. And we, that, we kind of took uh, a T-Rex uh, songs as the model for it. Because that's why it's sort of so riff-led, um, and you've got the Tony Visconti strings in the middle, which were a feature of a lot of Boland's hits. So mm. it was very influenced by Boland, that by yeah. the song. And uh, we kind of that, that kind of happened partly accidentally because of the dream and everything else. And we just said, you know what, that works, and it, and it suits us. It's a very medic thing to do. So mm. so yeah, it, it kind of came about quite naturally, really. Yeah, well, it, it, it does. Uh, you just mentioned who who would you say? Were your musical influences, influences and get me teeth organised, um, or heroes when you were growing up? I mean, you you were around about the same era as me, so uh, we've probably covered some of them. Yeah, well, I had quite a disparate uh, musical education, really, because I started off, uh, I mean, the first record, I, I went out 
the first two singles I ever bought were House of the Rising Sun by the Animals mm -hmm. and The Right to Work by Chelsea, who were a punk band. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the 60s and the 70s. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, you know they're, people didn't buy those two records together. But, but I did. And I used to go to punk clubs and people, you know, almost used to give me a good idea because I'd be saying to them, look, you've got to listen to the 60s.